Tonight, the death toll in Haiti's cholera epidemic soars above 250. Dr. John LaPook has the latest from the heart of the outbreak. I'm Randall Pinkston. Also tonight, bribery in Afghanistan. Charges that President Karzai's right-hand man is receiving cash by the bagful from Iran. Boxa versus Fiorina, the bitter battle in California that could decide control of the U.S. Senate. And visionary idea, how one optometrist is changing lives around the world, one pair of eyes at a time. This is the CBS Evening News with Russ Mitchell. Good evening. Russ Mitchell is off tonight. We begin this evening with mixed signals about the cholera outbreak in Haiti. The official death toll has increased tonight to 253. At the same time, the Haitian government says the situation is stabilizing. Our medical correspondent, Dr. John LaPook, is in Port-au-Prince tonight. Good evening, John. Good evening, Randall. I just finished speaking to the Haitian Ministry of Health and the CDC, and they said there's no way you can say that the situation is in any way stabilized or under control. And if it turns out that cholera is in fact in Port-au-Prince, all bets are off. We've had about 90 patients every day. We can discharge about 20, but then 20 more new ones come in. The focus now is on prevention. Non-governmental organizations are furiously dispatching trucks of supplies north to St. Mark and encouraging hand washing especially for children who are the most vulnerable. One of the simplest things they could do is frequent hang, hand washing, personal hygiene. Uh, that, that, that does wonders. Cholera is easily treatable for those who are lucky enough to get to the hospital in time. There are fewer people coming in, more people leaving. A lot of the people who look like they were uh, about ready to die this morning are sitting up, starting to drink, starting to take an interest in life around them. But for most, just getting there is a challenge. This man says she got sick last night. She got diarrhea and was vomiting. We had no time to take her to the hospital. While we were giving her a shower, she died. And this man's family was decimated by the disease. And I have my brother, he's dying. Your brother died? Yeah, I have my uh, sister's son, he's dying. I have my sister, uh, daughter's dying. Earlier today, I was in the courtyard of that hospital at St. Mark which is the epicenter of the cholera epidemic. There were hundreds of people there, and I spoke to one of the doctors from Partners in Health, which has been doing a terrific job in Haiti, and in his words, it's controlled chaos. Thank you, Dr. John LaPook in Port-au-Prince. We have a major story tonight from Afghanistan. A senior NATO intelligence source has told CBS News that Iran has been buying influence over the Karzai government with bags of cash. The story was first reported by the New York Times. Alan Pizzi has the latest. U.S. troops and their allies have another enemy on the Afghan battlefield, one they can't even see, never mind fight. Iran is sending millions of dollars into the country to promote anti-U.S. sentiment. The money goes into the hands of Umar Daudzai, chief of staff to President Hamid Karzai. The cash reportedly gives Iranian ambassador Feda Hussein Maliki preferential access to Karzai's inner circle, an Iranian channel to poison relations with Washington. The United States and its NATO allies will be unable to stop any real serious Iranian efforts to influence things in Afghanistan. The money won't necessarily buy Iran control, however. Karzai is on good terms with the Iranians, but he would find it difficult, if not impossible, to stay in power without U.S. backing. So the Iranians are playing both sides of the battlefront, U.S. sources say, funding, training and supplying intelligence to some elements of the Taliban. And just to underscore that Tehran can't be left out of efforts to end the Afghan war, Iranian diplomats were included in high-level talks held in Rome last week. We recognize that Iran has a role to play in the peaceful settlement of the situation in Afghanistan. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad seems to see that role in less than diplomatic terms. During a visit to Lebanon, he said the best exit from Afghanistan for what he called the occupiers was to apologize and pay compensation. Presumably that would be different from bags of cash. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, London. 
In this country, Campaign 2010 is racing towards its climax, and today the claims and counterclaims were flying thick and fast. From turnout to fundraising, top party spokespeople were presenting starkly different views. Joel Brown has the latest. With just nine days left on the campaign clock, Republicans are claiming all of the midterm momentum. And I think you're going to see a wave, an unprecedented wave, uh, on Election Day. Michael Steele thinks that wave will absolutely leave the GOP with a majority in the House and maybe even the Senate. Democrats say the tide is turning their way, with President Obama fresh off his longest campaign blitz yet for vulnerable Democrats. Party leaders are convinced he's closing the enthusiasm gap. From this point forward, it's all about turnout and ground game, and we're seeing good early voting trends, and, and we, we've got work to do, but we think we can do it. But early voting may not be good news in Nevada, where the president campaigned last week for Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. The endangered Democrat is in the re-election fight of his career against Tea Party favorite Sharon Angle. And so far, Republicans are outpacing Democrats in getting their voters to the polls. The GOP's also got a two-to-one edge in campaign contributions from outside groups, with much of it from anonymous donors. Two conservative groups led by Karl Rove are expected to raise $65 million to help fund the Republican surge. And, and, and let's just be honest, I would like to have a different system, but we have the system we have. Rove argues Republicans are merely leveling the playing field, since Democrats get money from outside groups too. $87 million alone from a union of state and local government employees. But Democrats say that GOP's donors will be expecting payback down the line. These big interests are fighting hard to get back in power, and I think the American people are waking up to that fact. While these midterm elections are expected to be the most expensive in history, there is proof that the money isn't everything. Three wealthy Republican candidates have spent a combined $243 million for their campaigns, and none of the big spending candidates is leading in the polls. Randall? Thank you. Joel Brown in Washington. Turning now to a pair of critical contests in California. A USC Los Angeles Times poll out today shows Democrat Jerry Brown with a 13-point lead over Republican Meg Whitman in the governor's race. Democratic Senator Barbara Boxer is eight points ahead of Republican Carly Fiorina. And Bill Whitaker tells us the race that could decide control of the Senate could be California. For Senator Barbara Boxer, it's good to have friends in high places. But even in this left-leaning state where the president is still popular, his embrace may not be enough. Keep on fighting for us for the next six years, Senator Barbara Boxer. For now, the three-term incumbent is fighting a nasty battle with Republican Carly Fiorina. 28 years of Barbara Boxer is long enough. The hard-charging former head of Hewlett-Packard has attacked Boxer for being overly partisan and ineffective. She even mocked her looks. God, what is that hair? <laughs> so yesterday. Fiorina is defying conventional California wisdom by running to the right. She says she'd vote to cut taxes and drill offshore. We now need to repeal this health care bill. A scrappy political fighter herself, Boxer has fired back. It is Boxer, pro-choice, versus Fiorina, anti-choice. Blasting Fiorina for being too extreme for California. When my opponent says, drill, baby, drill, yes, it won her the endorsement of Sarah Palin. I mean, this race looks like it's going to be decided by, you know, inches or feet or yards because voters um, really aren't very happy with their choices. They're also upset over the state's 12.4% jobless rate. So both candidates talk about jobs. Jobs, jobs. As a former CEO, Fiorina insists she knows how to create them. Boxer counters it's just the opposite. As CEO, she laid off 30,000 workers and shipped jobs to China. With the race so close and voter dissatisfaction so widespread, it could just come down to which party does a better job of firing up voters. And I think they'll choose me in the end. Fiorina is betting they won't, contributing a million dollars to her campaign in the final stretch. With control of the Senate at stake, it's sure to be a bruising battle till the bitter end. 
Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Los Angeles. Talk of a GOP takeover of one or both houses of Congress has many on Wall Street looking at history. Over the past 50 years, Democratic presidencies and Republican control of both houses have led to an annual stock market rise of more than 21 percent. But a Congress split between the parties has met a market rise of just 6 percent a year, no matter who controls the White House. Joining us to talk about that is Jim Awad, Managing Director of Zephyr Management. What is it, Jim, about the control of both houses of Congress in Republican hands and the White House in Democrat hands that seems to be best for Wall Street? Yes, because what it forces is compromise between the two different philosophies of the Republicans and the Democrats. And if you get compromise, you get things done, as opposed to a situation where uh, one side can stonewall the other. Now, what about the other scenario? Uh, Republicans in charge of one house, Democrats in charge of the other house, and of course the Democrats still in the White House. Right. That would be less attractive because what you want is a balance of power where the Republicans and the Democrats can checkmate each other and therefore are forced to compromise. A situation where the Democrats held the presidency and let's say the Senate, they would still be able to overwhelm the Republicans on most issues and you, you could get gridlock as opposed to results. Now of course the Democrats would argue, look, past couple of years under the Obama administration, the market hasn't done too badly. Why why can't that continue? Well, the market has done exceedingly well due to a confluence of circumstances and a bounce back from the near depression. But the market is looking forward and, and believes that the deficits, the federal deficits, are unsustainable and wants a blueprint for reducing them over time. And you're most likely to get that by compromise between the Republicans and the Democrats. And that would happen with a Republican House and Senate and a Democratic presidency. Thank you very much. Jim Awad, Managing Director of Zephyr Management. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, congressional ethics. Why do some members attract scrutiny while others do not? Whatever party wins control of the House in November, a lame duck session of Congress will convene later in the month. One item on the agenda, ethics trials of Charles Ringel of New York and California's Maxine Waters. But they are not the only House members who've had questions raised about their ethics. Cheryl Atkinson investigates. That's Congressman Sam Graves introducing a witness at a hearing promoting renewable energy interests. Brooks, thanks for being here. Congressman Graves failed to mention that Brooks Hurst was an old friend. The congressman also left out that his own wife and Hurst invested money in the same Missouri fuel plants. Congressman Waters argues that is the same thing she's accused of, helping a good friend in his company where her spouse owns stock. Yet Waters is the only one facing an ethics trial. When it comes to ethics, Congress largely polices itself. It set up two separate ethics bodies, but it turns out they almost always disagree. The House Ethics Committee is members of Congress judging their own. Too often, critics said they made excuses for colleagues rather than holding them accountable. To fix it in 2007, Congress created an independent office of congressional ethics. The independent office investigates cases and refers them to the House Ethics Committee, which decides whether to bring charges. Yet critics say some members of Congress, all of whom deny wrongdoing, are still getting a free pass. Take the case of Congressman John Carter. That's him criticizing Wrangell for, among other things, failing to disclose income. These are all violations of the rules of the House. But listen to Carter just a few weeks later. I made an error on my House financial disclosure forms. That's right. He got caught just like Wrangell, failing to report income, nearly $300,000 in profits from selling Exxon stock. But Carter isn't facing an ethics trial. In 11 out of 12 cases referred by the independent office, the House Ethics Committee decided not to charge any members. The independent office is looking at up to 42 unnamed members of Congress. If history is an indicator, the members have little to fear. If anyone should worry, it might be the independent office, which serves at the pleasure of Congress, those they investigate. Cheryl Atkinson, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Just ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, a beloved shopkeeper is murdered and a neighborhood asked why. Chicago's police chief announced earlier this month that the city's murder rate is down about 2% from last year. That's small comfort for the residents of a Southside community who are mourning the shopkeeper they knew as more than just a good neighbor. Here's Cynthia Bowers. To the people who knew and loved 59-year-old Bassam Naoum, this image says it all. Happy, happy, happy. So many 
Kenny turned up at a vigil outside his store the day after he was killed, Chicago police had to shut down the busy street. The man everyone called Ollie was shot six times in his small grocery last week, shocking even crime-hardened residents living in a neighborhood once home to the infamous Cabrini Green housing project. Ollie cared about this community. Ollie fed this community. Ollie built this community. He gave mothers free milk when they needed milk. He gave mothers diapers. He was a father, friend, a leader, a hero. When the Jordanian immigrant opened his first shop in 1993, Cabrini Green was a war zone. Gang snipers fired from housing project towers. School children were taught to duck and cover to avoid bullets, a time residents still refer to as the wars. Cecilia Nichols grew up then and later became Naum's employee. He was happy. He wasn't scared. He wasn't afraid. He was strong. For 17 years, his shops were social centers, safe havens in a not-so-safe community. And it was here that a man from halfway around the world became the much-needed heart and soul of a Chicago community. The massive project is mostly torn down now, and the neighborhood has become much safer, which makes Naum's murder even more mysterious. Police this week ruled out robbery as a motive, but the focus for his family and friends is not on how he died, rather how he lived. It's painful, but it's good to see that he had an effect on people, and he helped people, and that he was kind to people. I've been receiving emails, Facebook messages from people that I've never met, telling us about stories of how he helped them. The family isn't sure what will happen to his store, but they feel certain Ollie's legacy will live on. Cynthia Bowers, CBS News, Chicago. We'll be back. A garbage crisis is growing in Naples, Italy. As trash piled up on city streets, residents protesting a proposed dump at the foot of Mount Vesuvius battled police in the streets last night. More than 2,400 tons of garbage remain uncollected. Pop sensation Lady Gaga claimed today on her Twitter page that she's become the first singer to have one billion views on YouTube. Her hit Bad Romance alone has almost 300 million views. Singer Justin Bieber is right behind Lady Gaga and should hit a billion views next month. And an eerie sight off Cancun, Mexico, if you are a diver. A British sculptor is populating the seabed with more than 400 life-size concrete figures modeled from photos of real people. He hopes that over time, the figures will provide a new home for marine life as artificial reefs. Up next on tonight's CBS Evening News, a clear-sighted plan for helping the world's poor. Finally tonight, the challenge of truly helping the poor of the developing world can often appear daunting, which is where one far-seeing doctor comes in. Elizabeth Palmer has his story. More than one in three people in America wears glasses or contact lenses. But in developing countries, few have the luxury. They're simply left to cope in a blurry world. Not only because glasses cost money, but also because there are almost no trained optometrists to fit them. Enter the man you might call a visionary. I keep both eyes open, I cover one eye, and I gently adjust. Professor Joshua Silver, who after 25 years of research, believes there's a solution. Self-adjusting glasses. They come in two basic models. Double lenses that slide to regulate focus, and Professor Silver's own design that injects gel for an even clearer result. How extraordinary. Wow. I could, I could probably read your neighbor's address now. For people who haven't been able to see properly for years, putting on the glasses and dialing up perfect focus is a small miracle. Caught here on video by Adaptive Eyewear, a not-for-profit company that runs a program in Rwanda with local health workers to distribute the glasses. And she um, runs a little shop and she put glasses on for the first time and she was just so happy. She really just found it the most amazing experience. Now the technology has been fine-tuned. The next challenge is to get the cost down and the fashion factor up. My vision for vision would be to see a billion people wearing the eyeglasses they need by the year 2020. A billion people. 
Considering only 40,000 self-adjustable glasses have been fitted so far in the developing world, that's quite a prescription. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, London. That is the CBS Evening News. I'm Randall Pinkston, CBS News in New York. Good night.